Okay, so this is a continuation for previous video where we did the first three exercises up here. And now we're going to the fourth exercise, which is pretty tricky. Okay, it says that suppose you have a finite group G and a subset A such that the size of the subset is small. In what sense? Well, the size of the subset squared is still less than the size of the group. And now I want you to show that there is an element in the group such that that subset intersect with the subset times this element is empty. Okay? So, you have any ideas? How would you, what, what, how would you use any of the previous ones? Well, should we use the second one? This one? Okay. So, yeah, that seems relevant, right? Because it's giving you the condition for AX intersect A to be non-empty, which if you just negate that, it would give you the condition for it to be empty. So, what does it say? AX intersect A is non-empty if and only if what? Hmm? X equals to A inverse A. For some A and B and A. Mm -hmm. Now, can you describe that condition in terms of a set condition? What, what, what exactly is the set of such X? What set should X be in so that it can be written in this form? A inverse A. Capital A inverse A, right? So, this is the same as saying that X is in here. Mm -hmm. A inverse A. Think of what's A inverse A. What's that? It's a set of products of some of something in A inverted times something in A. Right? So and that's exactly the set of products of this form. So AX intersect A is non-empty if and only if X is in A inverse A. Okay? Hmm? Yeah. So AX intersect A is empty if and only if what? Hmm? X is not in A inverse A. Yeah, just write that down. Again, just, so, AX intersect A is empty if and only if what? X is not in A inverse A. Okay, so what do we need to show? In order to show there exists x in G such that something holds, such that ax intersect A is empty, what we need to show? We need to show there exists an x in G such that x is not in A inverse A. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, what is that equivalent to showing? The size of A inverse A is smaller yeah. than the size of G. Yeah, you actually went one step further. So, so this is, this thing is therefore equivalent to showing, so this is equivalent to showing that A inverse A is a proper subset of G. So it's, it's a subset of G already, but we want to show it's not all of G. Okay? Right? Yeah. Which now since it's a finite set, since we are talking of finite sets, this is equivalent to showing that what? The size of A inverse A is strictly less than the size of G. Because they are finite sets, you can just compare the sizes. Okay, good. Now, how would you actually show this? What what result do you use now, which tells you what the size of this can be? Well, well did we see any result about the size of products of sets? Yeah. When did we see that? The third. The third one. So it says that the size of the product of two sets is less than or equal to the product of the sizes. Okay? So what are the two sets that we are concerned with here? A inverse and A. A inverse and A. What do we know about the size of A inverse? That's actually something we didn't prove, but it's quite obvious. A inverse size of A. has the same size of as A. Okay, so 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 let me just go a little carefully. So so this thing, what we want to prove is equivalent to this. Okay, so it's enough to show. So it suffices to show, to show this. Because these are, these, what we've done so far, till here, is, is all two-way implications. Okay, so how do you prove this? Well, so, by this fact, 
this is less than equal to what? The size of A inverse A is less than equal to what? The size of A inverse times the size of A. Which is equal to, well, the size of A inverse, as you said, is the same as the size of A. And what what else do we know? What have we given? Okay, and that completes the proof, right? Because you have less than equal to, you have equal to and less than. So when you combine, you just get that the size of A inverse A is less than the size of G. So we are done. Okay. Hmm? Okay, so what, what's the trick? Well, there's actually no real trick. It's just a combination of lots of things. The, what we're trying to say is that if your set is real, subset is really small, you can find something to multiply it by so that A and AX are completely disjoint. Right? If A is a very large subset of G, on the other hand, it's hard to find sort of shifts of that, translates of that, which are completely disjoint from that. But if A is really small, you can always find such a thing. Okay, let's look at the next one. This one. So read that. If G, the size of G is less than the sum of the size of A and B, mm -hmm. then G equals to A times B. Okay, so this is sort of an opposite result to this. The previous one was saying if your subsets are really small, right, or rather this, the third one and the fourth one, similar things. The third one is saying if A and B are like too small. If the sub product of their sizes is less than the size of G, they can, the product cannot be G, right? What it's saying. The size of AB cannot be uh, more than the product of the sizes, which means if A and B are really small, their product cannot be G. Now, this is saying if A and B are quite big, so the sum of their sizes is already bigger than the size of G, okay? Then G is actually the product. So, so there's some sort of gap between it. This saying the product is small, then that then the product of the size is small, then the product is small. And this is saying the sum of the size is large, then the product is large. There's some gap between them because if the sum is small and the product is large, it's kind of ambiguous. Okay, but let's look at this. So how would you show this? So it's it's kind of similar to this, but now you have two sets A and B. So can can you make first tell me a version of? Okay, let me just do a few steps and then we'll see what's happening. I'll do it with the right multiplication instead of left. So just for variety. Okay, so. Oh, sorry, left mark. Okay, I'll switch the way it's going. Okay, but you can do the same with that. Right. Okay, so the proof for this one. So I want to consider something like AX intersect B, but I'll do it a little differently. So, pick G and G. What do you want to show? G is in A. So we want to show there exists A in A, B in B, such that G equals AB. Okay? Now here's how we do it. So first we consider the set GB inverse. Okay, actually, if you want to do exactly the same as a sort of analog, you would do B inverse G, but I'm just doing it now. So just to show you, you can work it either way. Okay, what's this set defined as? Hmm? G, B for R, B. G, B inverse. For R, B inverse and B inverse. Yeah, or you could just directly say B and B, right? Okay, now, first of all, do you use, what, what is the size of this set? How 
how does it compare to the size of A or B or whatever? Size. Well, you first have with B, you go to B inverse. Does that change the size? No. Then you multiply by G on the left. Does that change the size? No. No. Well, we did we did it with right multiplication here. Right multiplication by an element doesn't change the size, but the same is true of left multiplication. So the size of G B inverse is the same as the size of B. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. So now what can you say about A intersect G B inverse? by size considerations. Well, this goes back a bit to, to thinking of inclusion-exclusion. Have you heard of inclusion-exclusion? Mm -hmm. Or or just the, I guess you could call it the, yeah, inclusion exclusion for set. So you have this group G. You have a group G. You have a set A. And you have a set GB inverse. Okay, I want to show that they actually have an intersection. I want to show that the intersection is non-empty. Okay, mm -hmm. how do I do that? There is something in A that's also in G B. Yeah, and I want to use the size condition here. Well, okay. What is the? Do you know like the state the statement of inclusion exclusion for for two sets? Have you seen that? Yeah, well, it sounds very familiar, but I cannot remember. Can you give me a hint? Well, it says something like the sum of the size of these two sets and the size of the intersection and the size of the union. Have you seen that? Uh, the size of the union. Well, okay, I'll just say what, what statement. So there's actually a, uh, another version of it which is more tricky, but this is just for two sets, it's easy. The size of the intersection plus the size of the union. Have you seen this? Oh, that's like a partition. Well, it's not a partition. So what's happening is, is that in intersection, you're only counting the elements which are in both. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so everything in the intersection, you're counting twice. You're counting the intersection and in the union. Everything outside the intersection, but still in the union, you're just counting it once here. Yeah. But that's the same as you're doing here, right? Here, everything which is in the intersection, you're counting twice. And everything which is in only one of the sets, you're counting it only once. Yes. So that's why these two are equal. Okay. Now, what is... So now, I want to use this to show that the intersection is non-empty. How would I do this? Well, in our case, what do we know? What is the size of GB inverse? Hmm? B. The same as the size of B. Okay. And uh, the size of A intersect G B inverse is what we want to know. What can we say about the size of A union G B inverse? What's the most it can be? A times B. Well, that's one bound. But there's another bound you can do just because it's a subset of G. So it's size is at most the size of G. G. So I put less than equal to here. So now if I move uh, the stuff there, I'll get A intersect G B inverse is greater than equal to Now, we want to use that the size of G is less than the sum of the size of A and B. So what does that tell you about this side? We're at zero. So what does that tell you about this, this set size? No, empty. Well, it tells you the size is greater than zero, so it's non-empty. So this is non-empty. So what? So there exists A in A 
and B in B such that what? Such that what? Such that it's in the end. So A is equal to A B. No, no. G. The, so the intersection is non empty means there's an A in A which is in G B and what? Which means there's an A in A and a B in B such that A is G B in force. Right? We are saying there's an element which is in both sets. Mm -hmm. So that means it's of the form A where A is in A, but it's also the form G B inverse where B is in B. Okay. Now, how can we rewrite this? A B equals to. Okay, so multiply by G inverse both sides. Sorry, multiply by mm -hmm. sorry B both sides. And you get A B equals G as desired. Right? with A in A and B in B. But these proofs seem very formalistic, but there's, there's something going on here. So what you're saying is that A and B are so large that when you add up the sizes, you're more than the size of G. Okay? So you start with your element little g in G, which you want to show is in the product. Okay? You sort of say, what are the elements which, which are within a B distance of little g? Right? That's what this is saying. It's all the elements which when you write multiply by B, you get G. Right? And you're saying what are the elements which are in A? And that's those two, you, two sets you're considering. And you're saying that because these sets are so large, there has to be an intersection. Okay? So th there is actually a kind of intuition to this which is not too obvious. But, but this is a little tricky. So what have you seen if the sets are really small? their product cannot be the whole group. If the product of the size is less than the size of G, product cannot be G. If the sum of the size is greater than the size of G, then uh, then the product is G. Okay, what happens if, let's say you have G has size, I don't know, 60, and A and B have sizes, let's say, 10 and 12. Can you conclude anything? Let me just try Okay, let me do something for this. So if size of G is 60, size of A is 20, and size of B is 47. Can you conclude that AB is G? Yes. Because the sum of the sizes is bigger than G. Size of G is 60, size of A is 3 and size of B is 7. What can you say? Can you say that AB is G? No. Can you be sure it's not G? No. Well, you actually can be sure that AB is not G. Why? Uh, size. Yeah, so how? 37 is, uh, 21 is less than 60. Yeah, so the product of the size is smaller than 60, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, what if I give you G is 60? A is 10 and B is 12. Then what can you say? Well, the sum of the sizes is less than 60, but the product of the sizes is bigger than 60. So what can you conclude? Well, it's not clear just from this information. You actually need to know what the group is and what the subsets are. Mm -hmm. And only then one can figure out whether that product is G. Yeah. Okay, so these results leave leave a little ambiguity, and that's where the group structure actually comes in. Right, but this is saying that in extreme cases you can figure out even without knowing anything about it. Okay.